So in the beginning of our conversation, we talked about the three Syrian artists that you worked on in your book. But for this conversation, I'd like to focus on Fatah al Mudarris and uh, his uh, artworks. Um, first, can you simply introduce us to, to the sure. artist? Sure. I mean, look at this photograph. So here we regard Fatah al Mudarris. He's probably about 40 years old in this photograph. Yeah. Um, this is a photograph that is uh, reproduced in a um, book by Samar Hamarne that was produced in Damascus in the, if I'm remembering, the late 90s, not long before Mudadris passed away and contains a lot of interesting mementos from his career, uh, his, his sort of local standing as this brilliant thinker that came to dinner parties, taught in the classroom, hosted salons in his um, studio, and never agreed to basic social consensus, challenged every uh, value that, um, that any setting seemed to be settling on, right? So just this total contrarian who could best anybody in debates. Um, and as you know, I in the chapter, I actually use a lot a dialogue that he recorded with the poet Adonis. Um, yeah. And it's funny when you read that dialogue, I mean, it's very difficult as you'd expect <laughs> for Adonis and Fatah Helmandaris, and especially difficult for me as a non-native speaker. I like, you know, spent a year trying to get through the prose, but with my Arabic teachers, we always felt that Mudaris was winning every battle of wits with Adonis. Like he could twist, he could twist any conviction. So that's Mudaris's sort of standing that grows over the years, just as this thinker who's not going to rest for the reach for the easy consensus. As a painter, um, he is born in uh, Aleppo in the early 20s. Um, and his first, you know, two decades of his life are actually in Aleppo, uh, yeah. which everybody mentions, but the sort of stakes of what it meant to grow up in Aleppo versus, for instance, Damascus, that Damascus becomes, exactly. you know, that becomes the capital. And because it's the capital becomes also the capital of the, like where the art school, the national art school is in Damascus. So Damascus becomes the defining center for, Syrian art uh, as a kind of metropole that people make their way to. But in the in the 40s, when so much was structured differently, um, Aleppo has its own center of gravity, its own kind of links as a, as a capital for trading um, that has a lot of French and British trade legations there, right? And like access to commodities, just everything slightly different, different literary figures. And Mudaris starts there and he starts there um, amongst a group of surrealist poets and thinkers. Uh, and that's a formation you don't see in Damascus. Damascus is the like administrative head. Everybody in Damascus is trying to make booster-ish national arts that are gonna contribute to strengthening uh, the like, you know, strengthening the pedagogical apparatus for new citizens in Damascus or in Aleppo rather, they're very dissonant and they're thinking about the psychology and they just have a, a different set of investments. So one of the contributions I hope the chapter makes is to take very seriously the Aleppo formation of Mudadris. And then you asked me just to introduce him, I'm going on and on. But from the fifties onward, he is more based and he studies in Italy yeah. And then when he, come, when he comes back, he does settle in Damascus because he becomes a really important art teacher there. And his method of painting, like the painting behind you, and then the painting we see here, the painting we see here is from the mid 60s. And it's in a phase where he's painting a lot of monsters. So Mudaris is interested in the mythic and the psychological and the childlike as something that kind of knit together as a node for different models of history. And this is a giant rendering in his characteristic sort of rough intuitive brush stroke of these teethed monsters that are appearing through the texturing of this um, surface. And he becomes very well known for mixed media, putting sand in there, being very messy, like dripping weird stuff, uh, cigarette ash, you know, anything will go on there and the canvases accrue this texture. Um, that's important for him as a dream, you know, a place for capturing nightmares or suppressed yeah. uh, ideas and things like that. 
so uh, you, you said that Fatah uh, Mudaris was uh, so from Aleppo and a surrealist uh, movement uh, occurred there. And in the early works uh, of the artist, uh, we can see this inspiration from uh, surrealism. In your book, you wrote, uh, I quote, Al Mudaris used his surrealist artworks as occasions to force viewers to reflect on their own habits of interpretation. Uh, here we have an example from uh, 1952, where the artist uh, depicted a, a scene where we can see a camel with Bedouins and uh, a face which recalls uh, Syrian ancient art. Um, I'd like to know why this combination of Bedouin uh, life way and ancient uh, civilization in this, uh, in this work. So this drawing on the left, I mean, I just love it. I love this drawing. <laughs> I use this drawing all the time. I think it's incredibly um, powerful and uh, challenging for that, for that reason of interpretation. So this is a sketch um, that begins from an inkblot uh, compositional strategy that we often refer to as a Rorschach test that um, is a kind of psychological interpretive uh, tool or um, what, uh, yeah, structure of um, psychoanalysis for a patient where in the pop cultural rendition, the therapist would sort of show the ink blot, which is, pro which is produced um, what we refer to as automatically, right? So the ink sort of flows by its own accord because it's got water and it uh, makes this shape and no person has deliberately gone in there and traced the outline. The ink sort of goes as far as it can and then dries on the paper. And you have this folded center of symmetry to produce it. So we have Mudaris playing with that structure uh, in the same way, sort of letting the ink go. And then he doesn't determine where it flows to, but instead, what the drawing captures is him responding to the shape once it presents itself. And so it's handy for me thinking about one, the fact that Mudaris um, liked to often in this period, make his drawings in the semi kind of pub shared space of a cafe or something. He was known every night he went and yeah. hung out and drank and like yes. quoted poetry and um, entertained people. So maybe people watched him while he made this, right? Like you can, you imagine everybody coming in and seeing what will be revealed. And then he adds context to the ink blot. And so that become, that is a kind of psychological interpretive action. Like what do you see and what does it make you think of or how do you feel? And so he gives us a version of this blot revealing itself where he puts it in the context of a kind of um, indigenous setting like mm -hmm. the Bedouins in the Syrian desert, not his setting at all, right? He's an absolutely urbane Aleppo <laughs> learning <laughs> French, you know, right? Like, yeah. but he gives us this, you know, ethnicized possible past or maybe present that's coming forward and claiming space with him. And so it's, and this for him, and again, for his colleagues in the, um, circle of surrealist thinkers like the Ma uh, Orhan Mayasar and um, Adnan Mayasar, they're, um, you know, they're reading a lot of psychology. So this idea of repressed material or material beneath the surface always being ready to come forward um, is of interest to them. And the other thing I just find powerful about the drawing is I, I do think the central face where actually you can't see any features, but Mudaris makes it like a face because they put the headdress on there. Yes. It's very scary. Exactly, very scary. Yeah. <laughs> very scary. It is effectively scary. No matter what he draws on there, it's still, it becomes more present and like less reconcilable to the drawing. And so the tension of the presence is, I think Mudaris is really interested in, and he carries that forward. Again, I can't, I mean, because you, are strategically posed in front of a Mudaris painting. Behind you, he doesn't use the ink blot, but you'll notice that every hat, like every face there, he's put this like tall headdress of fake authority onto these figures and this like dream horse that emerges that's a centaur. He's really interested in presence that then grows these crowns and like 
claims to authority that it may not deserve. Uh, and he, he continues that for decades, um, that kind of questioning in his art. Uh, so with this uh, sketch uh, dates from 1952, uh, during the 50s, so Syria was independent. Um, what was the relationship between Syrian people and their cultural and historical heritage? Once yeah, ex excellent question. Country. Because we're talking about the present, the past. So which yep. are we talking about? Yeah, very good question. You know, in the fifth, so if we're talking about the 50s specifically, uh, it's an it's an interesting time. The, the 50s are a time of a lot of different uh, uh, shifts in the sort of executive branch of the uh, Syrian government. In, in 1949, there are three different coups. Um, and then there are later coups as well. So it's a, a kind of in time of oscillating the occasional free election to bring in a, a president and then the occasional removal of that president by shadowy potentially CIA forces. So the kind, the kind of ex executive branch of central power uh, shifts a lot. But the National Museum has been in place since the colonial period. So in the 50s, there are uh, figures that are interviewed frequently in the national press who are touting ongoing um, discoveries at archaeological digs um, that, again, those digs had start, started before the, oh, yeah. before the independence period. But what becomes important in the 50s is the fact that those projects of discovery on behalf of Syria, but also on behalf of the world, right? Mesopotamian heritage, Syrian heritage, these early civilizations are claimed as the progenitors to all other civilizations Religion. everywhere, right? Like, so this, like this biblical archeological imagination of everybody's heritage being um, recoverable in Syria, Iraq, uh, Egypt, that's still in place. So the, <clears throat> the kind of directors of archeology span have a lot of uh, clout and a lot of excite world excitement around what's getting found in Syria. And so there's the museum, is really important for the ancient stuff, just as a as a kind of evidence of uh, an ability to undertake that work independently, right? Like Syrian archaeology is going to be a player. Um, and then in 1953, there's the creation of the modern art wing at the National Museum in Damascus. So the 50s is also a time where the museum, which had always been oriented ever more deeply in the past in terms of what was getting collected, there is a sense that the National Museum ought to also be a steward of the modern arts, um, and that starts to get set up. Only later when Syria enters into the union with Egypt, it does the cultural ministry get set up. So that's not until 1958, but as early as 1953, the national salons, the first ones made in 1950, that are devoted to contemporary art, from 53 onward, the state does start collecting um, artworks out of those sales okay. and puts them into the museum collection. So the museum, interestingly, becomes a place for conjoining very deep past and modern art into, into an idea of an like, omnibus structure for preserving creative activity. Because uh, I'm asking you this question in, uh, in this chapter, you tend to show al uh, understanding of the heritage object that you defined as, I quote, a relics of a continuous struggle between life and death. Uh, here we have uh, two, uh, again, two works uh, from Fatah uh, al And you made a comparison with this uh, spiral uh, element with the, the shape of the ear from objects of mm -hmm. I was asking myself, you know, as a good historian, when you're trying to make an argument about what an artist intends, <laughs> uh, always in a qualified way, whatever they intend may not be the, the meaning, right? But, but when I'm trying to figure out what I think would daughters put pressure on or like attended too closely in his practice, I always have to try to figure out what, it, yeah, to your question, what was he reading 
or seeing or witnessing um, to give shape to his idea of heritage. Yeah. And one of the ways I actually substantiate what I think his reading of heritage is and his reading of heritage um, in his poetry, in the short stories that he wrote and in the interviews that he gives is an interestingly negative view of heritage. He's very interested in heritage, um, but he often sees it as these documents of, of not only a struggle for life and death, but as civilizations that maintain their order through violent sacrificial acts, right? So a lot of the material heritage getting uncovered um, pertaining to Assyrian ancient cultures, for instance, um, the, especially the colonial archeologists saw sort of interpreted the remaining structures that they found, they saw a lot of altars or sort of spaces for shedding blood in a ritualized uh, context. And they were reading the recovered cuneiform epic poetry um, that also talked about sort of sons that were uh, sacrificed for the rebirth of others. And yeah. so, for, so for Mudares and for many other, you know, the Tamuzi poets to come, that uh, write for Shar magazine. There, there's a kind of sense that this, the logic of these story cycles from the ancient past all the way to the present is, is um, the impetus is the sense that in order for the world to renew itself, renew itself yeah. there has to be this punctuation of a of a sacrificial act where a person is made to suffer for the good of everybody else. And, and of course that's in Christian story cycles. It's in the so-called classical story cycles. It's the um, uh, fertility rites of ancient civilizations. And for Mudaris in the fifties of a time constant like political overturning, it's also in the logic of modern politics that there are these sacrificial figures men marched off to war, you know, that that sacrificed themselves for the ostensible good of everybody else. So he, um, when he encounters a remnant or a fossil or a, a fragment from the past, for him, it's not celebratory. And it's not showing the great integrated past, it's showing yet another piece of evidence of this um, cycle that we're all made to live. Uh, so I, I'm interested in what I see as little instincts in his compositional choices that to my mind are either fairly literally tracing a cycle, right? So our fossil on the left, which he calls dancer of the age are these bones that are connected and made to, to encompass one another. So the piece is growing through the the remnants of previous life and it's growing in a scary it's again a sort of body without a face so you have that the the um, uncanny presence that he's interested in in this ink blot sketch i mentioned the um these the little ink blots that hang down from the flayed ink blot like little children or something the daughters makes look even more like bodies because he gives them tiny little feet and then he traces a spiral on where the head might be to create these sort of ears that are extra supplements to the ink blot. So I, I, he often starts with a presence and then builds it into a body that's not exactly a whole body, but that has these sensory pieces. And I know that he looked at the illustrations to um, uh, the excavations from Ur that Leonard Woolley was publishing because in newspapers, um, uh, that 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 El Bene, this uh, journal in or this newspaper in Damascus is publishing. They have clippings from these yeah. these excavations, right? So we know that uh, Mudaris and his colleagues were thinking through these kinds of images. Images and these right and these images also show you have on the left. I mean, it's the most haunting thing. It's a it's <laughs> like a it's a little helmet that was found in the in the excavation at Ur that had been that suppose according to Leonard Woolley who always told like tall tales 
it had a crushed skull inside. So it had, it was supposed to be protecting somebody that was, that died at Ur. And the, and yet the helmet has these uh, alien ears there that with a little hole to allow for hearing. So this, the kind of poignant fragments that are left behind from a civilization that are these efforts by a body to extend itself uh, to survive um, for me is part of the aesthetic of, of these sort of outside excavators they're actually sending this around the world as the evidence of what they've found and I see Mudaris playing with this kind of imagery in mm -hmm. his right in his responses to um, the psychological remnants from the past that he's producing that he's find that he's discovering within himself or confronting uh, and he does in his surrealist poetry which arthur is it's very bad poetry nobody should have to read it. it's not enjoyable <laughs> but it, he um he does always in the great surrealist fashion talk about like a single eye that's been dislocated or a sensory organ that has yeah. lost it, the rest of itself so there's that element that kind of aesthetic association for him as well and uh, in the 60s uh, he painted many scenes related to the peasantry and the figure of the child um, we have uh, here the painting called the child and the wall that Modaris uh, exhibited at the gallery, gallery d'art moderne en France, in in Damascus. Um, what does uh, this uh, image of the child mean to the to the artist? Sure. Well, and I'm going to try to be shorter because I've been filling. I've been going on and on because these are such oh, good no, questions. No. But um, for me, that one of the uh, biggest paradoxes in the celebration of Mudaris. And uh, don't get me wrong, I think he's a great artist. I think he's, I mean, he's a, you know, just a great artist. Everybody should pay attention to him. Uh, a lot of the writing about Mudaris talks about this, his treatment of uh, children and peasants as if he uh, was delivering to us feel good, affirmative images of um, happy Syrian life or something. Yeah. But it, it, he isn't, I mean, if you look <laughs> at the paintings, they are always, uh, some, there's always something jarring in there, unresolved. Um, and in the 60s, frankly, stained with red pigment, like blood. Like, I mean, these are not to my, I don't, I just don't see how you can look at the painting on the left and, uh, give it a narratival frame that's talking about the joy or spontaneity of childhood because the that's there um, but even this rendering of a child it's rendered in the schematic lines of somebody who's seen how children draw you know like there's already a kind of no. um, effort half futile effort to revive that spontaneity and it doesn't feel um, spontaneous but I also write you know I'm interested in this red bit that's added above the horizon line that's doubling as the top of a house or something that feels like a misplaced stain and the hand which um, can either be the sort of hand of a celebration like if you know if you get married and you sacrifice a sheep and you mark that felicitous occasion for all to see and to like further the blessing um that is that's sort of an element of the same cycle that we were just talking about the kind of sacrifice of one thing to um, provide for everybody else yeah. Mudaris gives us that mark and for me it doubles also as an idea of the origins of all art like cave painting the kind of supposed earliest instinct is to mark a person's presence with a hand in the in, in these like caves of Lascaux. So it, for me, it, it starts to be a bunch of signs asking about what is driving anybody to create or leave a mark. And then this Masha Allah at the top, right, which just even if it simply said Masha Allah, it doesn't it's to me, these are like signs of questioning. They're not simplistic. Uh, Oh, how lovely a mother and child. Like on the right, yeah. we have a mother, child, and a bunch of red smears that seem to be making their way into everything. So you have a, a unit of care 
that's also potentially a unit of violence. Um, and that, that double sensibility, um, you know, Modaris really was interested in children, but not in children as always good, children as goodness fated to be brought into the same system of, of um, kind of social sacrifice uh, that, that he had perceived to be part of modern Syrian and mo all modern life, actually. And in that same period, uh, he produced uh, paintings illustrating mythical and uh, religious uh, themes, as we can see in these two examples, the Virgin and the Child from 1961 and right. Eve from 1963. Oh, look at Eve. <laughs> this is a, this is an interesting painting. I'm glad that you put this in. <laughs> I'm glad that the Dalul collection acquired this. Uh, can you explain us uh, the relationship of the artist with uh, the holy imagery? Yes. And w why would you say a holy image? In yes, your book? sure, absolutely. Yes, um, and I think one piece of contextualizing detail uh, is that Mudaris is a Muslim, uh, and you know, is a father Sunni, sort of landowning Aleppo family, mother Kurdish. Mm -hmm. uh, so his childhood entry into the kind of symbolic religious order is through Quranic uh, invocation, you know, the kind of literary Quranic literary tradition and things like that. Um, and he is really interested in the presence of the of Christian sort of Christian iconography, thinking about the about Christ and the problem of Christ's creation, whether through virginal birth or not, which isn't the primary interest in, in Mudaris's religious background, but is for him this interesting conundrum of how new life is um, brought into the world and then valued or not. So for him, the picture of the, you know, of the Virgin and the Child, which is what he titles this painting on the left. And he puts this into the national exhibition, right? Under the title, The Virgin yeah. and the Child. Um, I see his choice of rendering here uh, in a continuum with that painting, The Child on the Wall that we were just looking at in the previous slide where Mudaris has actually treated the canvas almost like a plaster fresco. It's got, he like pats on white that, uh, pigment that eventually starts to crack, it's pretty thick. And then on that wall draws sort of basic lines to etch in there the presence. So for me, it's already a kind of ideogram about the question of the virgin and the child. And then I'm really interested, and in this, this regard, I'm guided by both my daughter's um, uh, like surviving wife, his widow and his children who've talked to me about specifically gold leaf yeah. as an element in my daughter's work. So gold leaf is another interesting tactic that artists use in like in icon painting. It, it marks the divinity, um, but it's also completely a trick. It's just a little, you know, it's not solid gold. Nobody thinks it is, but it, it functions symbolically and yet it has an element of the actual material. And my daughter's in the sixties and onward makes good use of gold leaf always however when he puts it on a thing he doesn't cover i mean he puts it on poorly strategically poorly <laughs> so that the gold leaf sits there and doesn't actually achieve um, either a kind of total symbolism nor a total uh, illusion so on the left we have just a weird one little tidbit of gold yes. leaf below yes. the halo uh, not the halo, not, you know, not a thing, just a patch that yeah, sits just, there yeah, stupidly, yeah. right? Like <laughs> under the thing, which I do write about in the book. It becomes then a competition for how you suggest holiness. Yellow paint as a circle, totally arbitrary sign. Gold leaf as nothing, you know, so then yeah. everything on here is fairly futile and becomes about efforts to get at that, that possibility. Eve, the temptress, so... Notice with Eve from 63, Mudaris has spent 
an unusual amount of time on this painting making three-dimensional shape. Normally, he's not very interested in modeling, but here we have a female body of temptation that he's given her an actual belly. You know, he's given, he's actually given breasts and the arm feels like it actually has musculature. He's shaded areas. Um, normally, he's just drawing the lines on there. So here he's give, I, we could read this as the problem of temp, what is actually temptation in an artwork it's when you start to actually present the flesh like it's something somebody can have versus an idea. So I'm interested in that. And then look his little gold leaf on the apple, yeah. which again, I mean, he could have covered the whole apple. It's, <laughs> it, feel, it feels very tactical to just like touch it with another fake yes. bit of glimmer, right? Uh, and to mark the thing that's most dangerous with the most artifice. And he gives us a little bit on the earring. So she's very adorned uh, and it's a, you know, a meditation on that, on temptation representation uh, would be how I would read it. This is a weird painting. It's a weird painting. It's very dark in person. Like it's hard to yeah, see. Uh, he also uses cheap paint, right? He's not, in, <laughs> he's not interested in quality. So it could, have, it could conceivably have been brighter in 63. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, right? <laughs> Um, in 1933, uh, Jamil Saliba wrote an essay in the journal uh, Al Tafafa. Uh, he wrote, uh, I quote, Syrians today are anxious because they hesitate between the past and the future. They do, they do not know which image from life's images they are following, nor toward which pole they are heading. For the past shakes them and the new life's life provokes them. So in your book, you wrote, and I quote again, beautiful agitations features the painters who favored anxious manifestation over smooth representation. So what is this anxiety about? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's where I would actually say th that anxiety is a very, um, intellectually robustly mapped anxiety by anti-colonial thinkers that are trying to reckon with the dislocating effects of uh, a, a sort of development of meaning, collective meaning that gets interrupted by a tactical incursion by a, a system of um, control that is that announces itself as modernity yeah. so this is a this is a 20th century several generations of makers who can feel the um discontinuity of the models that seem to be at hand and diagnose the o oscillating uh fascination that the, that they can feel in themselves and in their students as anxiety and the power of what Saliba, for instance, Mudaris, Ismail, and Gibran of what they decide is that they aren't going to seek to resolve that, that they're gonna take the oscillation as the power of what they can do. And that is how these figures are very engaged with heritage, but aren't practicing the motif driven you know I'm interested in heritage because I'm showing you a woman getting water from the well. Like they're, they're not interested in the literal heritage um, idioms that do become very commonplace and expected in uh, later Syrian art and later art all over the place. Um, they're interested in the power of accepting instability um, in the kinds of um, testimonies that they can give as thinkers, but then also in what they can deliver as an image to audiences, right? So they're not gonna give you an easy image. They're gonna give you an image where you might gain some kind of awareness from the way it further destabilizes you or like the way it refuses to resolve. Um, and that is, that's, you know, that is not a decolonial response, but that's a very self-consciously ex-colonial um, or anti-colonial way of thinking about what art might deliver to a political cause, which is why I call this modern painting and 
politics in Syria. I think a question for a lot of uh, these makers is the sort of, can we derive collective power from something other than what our government's offering us from, a, from above? Um, and that's where the fact that these artists were often working in uh, collective settings, right? Like the poetry circles in Aleppo or the, um, in the case of Ed Hennem Ismail, the early, early more radical bath uh, party gatherings to think about how art can actually get activated in, uh, in a collective, but not a collective that's expected or convened by the state government, but a set of relationships to one another that might become visible in art or in poetry or in a kind of cultural production of, of that time. Thank you so much, Annika for your uh, participation in this panel. It was amazing to hear you speak and uh, congratulations for your book. Well, thank you, Arthur. Thanks thank for the so invitation. Thank, thank you to you. Dalul. Thank you for showing this Mudaris the whole time. <laughs> uh, Hopefully we'll your... see you soon in Beirut so we can see, see that. I hope, yeah? I hope, yeah. Thank, thank you, bye-bye. So bye, Arthur. Bye.